Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, where we uncover the truth of the Bible through archaeological and biblical research. Today, archaeologist Dr. Scott Stripling joins us via Skype from the Bible Seminary in Katy, Texas. And we're going to be talking about a somewhat different but very interesting subject today. The ritual purity movement in the days of Jesus. And Scott, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Hi, Henry. I'm glad to be with you today. Well, it's good to see you, and uh, it's always great to have you on the program. You have so many fantastic insights and your expertise uh, in in the Bible and archaeology. I know it blesses our audience. It certainly blesses me, my friend. Well, thank you. And So so we're going to talk about something a little different, the ritual purity movement in the days of Jesus. We're going to set that up and explain that to folks. But so, you know, in, in presentations where you've talked about this, you said that a wave of ritual purity went through Second Temple Judaism mm-hmm. uh, during and up to the time of Jesus. So let's set the stage. Explain to the audience what that means. So about 100 BC, apparently our our Jewish population in the area of Judea began to interpret Leviticus 11 through Leviticus 15 more fundamentally, I guess you would say. And you have some unique verses in there about pottery becoming ritually impure. When your pottery becomes impure, says the Lord, you must break it. Uh, But there's some other aspects of the ritual purity culture that then they kind of add on to that. And so there are seven different indicators that I've found of that ritual purity culture. And, of course, we excavated at Kerbet el Makader, this microcosm of a site 10 miles north of Jerusalem, and we found all of those indicators there. Yeah, now, uh, for those who aren't familiar with Kerbet el Makader, we identified that site as the Eye of Joshua. But we found a first temple, uh, excuse me, a first century village there that uh, really is a microcosm of Jerusalem, as you explained. And this is where we've discovered evidence that's consistent with what you're talking about. So, Scott, we'll build on that a little bit. What what do you see as the motivating factor with that? You mentioned Le- the Le- Leviticus passages, but you know what what do you think is happening there, where there's this intensification of this movement? Okay, well, three possibilities exist. Um, Shimon Gibson and others have suggested that there was a surplus population, and Herod had this massive building program, and at times when there were downtimes in that between construction projects, that you had surplus labor, surplus talent, and that this ritual purity culture, at least the stone vessel aspects of it, um, were concomitant with that. Uh, Secondly, some have argued for passive resistance, that this uh, counterculture was a way of passively resisting Rome's hegemony over over the Jews. And then thirdly, some have argued, like Jody Magnus and Andrea Berlin, for a wave of ritual purity that was religiously motivated. I, I think there's more weight of evidence on the final point, although I also have to say that the second part of um, passive resistance might also play into it. Okay. Okay. So primarily you're in your view, the third argument of the religious aspect connected to Leviticus is really what motivates this. So maybe we could, we could begin with particularly uh, the term mikvah or the plural mikvahot, and that'll sort of enter into a discussion of, well, what is ritual purity? What did it look like during this time period? So they begin to bathe daily in these what are called mikvaot or or water tanks, what we might in Christian parlance call baptistries, but in areas where they did not have running water. Like if you're by the Sea of Galilee, you don't find a whole lot of mikvaot because they were able to use the Sea of Galilee as a huge uh, mikvah. But they would immerse themselves daily, and normally it would be a matter of taking off all one's clothing, going down into the water, self-immersion, coming back out of the water, sometimes on the opposite side of the mikvah, and then uh, putting back on the clothing, and now one has achieved ritual purity. But the problem is that one could continually become ritually impure, and so they're having to go through this continually. Uh, at Qumran, for example, they were obsessed with this, and they they baptized themselves numerous times each day, like after every bodily function, for example. Well, that's that's fascinating. So, so this was not 
about hygiene. <laughs> no, they didn't take a bar of soap with them down in there. Uh, what they thought was making them right with God uh, in actuality, I think, was harming their health because at Qumran, they were not living to the same age as the average Jewish population in Palestine at the time. And so <clears throat> when you think about it, they're sharing the same water. And there was some circulation, but it's very primitive. And so you can see where that would be non-hygienic. So what was intended to make you clean actually may have been killing them. Oh, my goodness. Boy, you know, you, you wonder about that. It's kind of the reminder of uh, lead getting into the water of the ancients in the Roman Empire. They had no idea that, you know, this was something that was actually mm -hmm. harming them. That's interesting. So you mentioned baptism, Scott. And, and so this is a forerunner to baptism. Maybe maybe you could talk about that a little bit, how you see that connection between the New Testament and, and this older practice. The woman at the well, you'll remember in John 4, uh, had a conversation with Jesus about living water. Well, living water is the terminology that we get from the Talmudic literature referring to, uh, to, to the mikvah uh, immersion. So when they go down into the mikvah, it has to be running water or living water, and that's something that's done continuously. So when Jesus says to her, I can give you living water and you'll never thirst again, you can see where she's struggling with that concept a bit. So it's uh, about 100 BC, they begin to practice daily immersion in water. And on the day of Pentecost, the fact that 3,000 people were baptized after Peter's sermon is not really a big deal. They were going to get baptized anyway. <laughs> you never go into the temple without going through ritual immersion. Yeah. The miracle in that story is that they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's right. what changed everything. Yes, and the, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, of course. So there's a tie in there. Let, I, you know, I think in our next segment, let's build on that a little bit. Um, um, so the idea was that this water would purify them before God. So, so do you, did you see this as a shift away from the, the idea of the sacrifices of the temple? Or was this more, hey, I'm living out in the, in the villages and towns what, what, what are your thoughts about that as far as the big mm. picture of religious practice goes? I think it was a, another layer, if you will, of religiosity, of, of maybe legalism in our terminology. So people were practicing mikveh immersion in Jerusalem big time and also out in the country big time. So there have been like 700 mikvot that have been documented throughout the country so far. No doubt there are a lot more than that. We excavated uh, three at Kerbet el Makader and several more at Shiloh. So, you know, the numbers are just growing all the time. Yeah, it's all over the country. Well, folks, uh, uh, we've just finished up our first segment here with Dr. Stripling talking about the ritual purity movement in the days of Jesus. And we'll build on that some more in our next segment. We'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. I'm here with archaeologist Dr. Scott Stripling. We're talking about ritual purity in the days of Jesus and exploring uh, some of the practices from that time period related to immersion in water. Now, Scott, you mentioned uh, that uh, this practice in Judaism was a, f a forerunner to Christian baptism. Maybe we could explore that a little bit more. We excavated a baptistry at Kerbet el Makarar also, for day, very early, dating to the 4th century inside our, our church. And so you can see on one part of the site we have the, the mikvot from this earlier period, 1st century B.C., 1st century A.D. Then a, a few centuries later we see Christians with baptistries, if you will, which is very similar to the mikvah. 
Um, did the water itself save them or did this represent something to them? Um, I, I, I think the act of baptism was very important to the early Christians, and some, like Constantine, postponed baptism until his deathbed, essentially, because they felt like you weren't supposed to sin again after you were uh, baptized. Yes. But uh, I, I think the roots of Christianity are definitely in the soil of Judaism, and the fact that, you know, the, that motif carried over should not surprise us. Yeah, and I've, I've seen, uh, I mentioned this to you, I've seen this online where people say that that's a problem for the gospel and that kind of thing. But, you know, we serve a sovereign, holy God who can take anything he wants and sanctify it and redefine it the way that he sees fit. And clearly we see that. He takes it to, he connects it now with the ministry of Jesus. I mean, that's partly what Jesus is doing when he's talking about, you know, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's right there in the New Testament from Jesus himself. So why people see that as problematic, I'm, I don't know. But let, let's shift for now to another important category, and that is the vessels that they use. There's these unique vessels from this time period connected to ritual purity. And maybe you can tell the audience about that, please. When your pottery becomes impure, says the Lord, you must break it. As if we don't already have enough broken pottery <laughs> in Israel, now we have God commanding us to, to break it. Yes. And it, you could trans anything that anytime you were ritually impure and you touched pottery because it was made of earthen clay, then you could transfer impurity to it. And so they're breaking vessels, many times puncturing them, just putting a, a hole through them. And in their place, about 100 B.C., we see an appearance of a new type and maybe maybe closer to the third decade into that first century B.C., uh, still in the Hasmodean period, you see that, that uh, usage of stone vessels. So they're taking limestone vessels that are either handmade or lathe-made, basins and cups and dishes of, of all kinds, and they then appear in the archaeological record at sites where they're practicing these other ritual, cure, ritual purity uh, factors. Now, at some sites, like in, in Samaria, you don't see them at all. Interestingly, you have a type of pottery called Eastern Terra Sigillata ware, which is a very fine imported Roman ware that disappears from the sites in Judea and in the Galilee at the same time that the stone vessels appear. And so there's a very definite shift in the material culture. Yeah, and so, so in, in the big picture of what you're putting forth here is in the archaeology, that shift is taking place. Religious practice, most likely the motivation, makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, interestingly, uh, here's a question: Do we see a mention of these vessels in the New Testament? John chapter 2, the first miracle of Jesus, he turns water into wine. Now, if you go back and read that account in John 2, you'll see that they the, the large jars were stone jars, stone vessels. They were ceramic. Now, we have large ceramic vessels like bag storage jars, we would call them from that time period. Uh, and Jesus even referred to when he told the disciples going to Jerusalem, and you'll see a man carrying a jar of water, follow him. Well, that's a different thing. Here in John 2, there are stone vessels, and a number of these have been found in the Jewish quarter in Qumran and at other sites. They fill them with water. He turns them into wine. And so there you see it. There, there, there are the stone vessels that Jesus is using in this first miracle. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I don't want to overinterpret that, but it seems because it's connected to a wedding ceremony, which they would have saw as sacred. Perhaps the water is there for that for that particular purpose because of the sacredness of marriage and the and the covenant bond that's about to take place. It's it's very fascinating. How how about uh, when the Jesus washes the disciples' feet? Is it possible to use okay. a st stone basin? That's a great question. In our olive press cave, which was reused as a hiding system during the Great Revolt, it had a mikvah on one side and a mikvah on the other, which is another indicator of ritual purity, by the way, that perhaps they were what they were producing, they were maintaining purity while they were doing it because it was going to the temple in Jerusalem. But the, the basins, we found two basins inside that cave. Never anywhere in any excavation in Israel have these particular basins been found in situ. 
they have been found out of context or on the antiquities market. So they're really neat basins. And we have the actual citations from the Talmudic literature where this size of basin is what would have been used for ritual foot washing. And so it's very fascinating that the basins that we have may have actually – may give us a, a picture – of what Jesus used when he washed the disciples' feet. Yeah, that that I you know I didn't know I didn't know that that I was in the Tal- Talmudic lit- literature. Now that's the Jewish uh, development after the destruction of the temple in in their religious texts. So the actual dimensions are there, and that's the one that we found at Kerbet El Makar. Yes, two of them we actually found, and it talks about how much water they would hold and how they would be used, and that they're made of, of stone. And so Yoel Elitzor, a very renowned professor in Israel, is the one that actually gave me those citations and helped me link those basins into that ritual purity culture. That's excellent, Scott. Now we got about 45 seconds. I would like you to give an intro about ossuaries. We're going to switch subjects, and then we'll pick up on that in our next segment. So you got about 45 seconds. People began to bury their dead differently at the same time that they began to use the mikveh and the stone vessels. Uh, Instead of gathering the bones after the body uh, decomposes after one year into a repository underneath the the slab where they might normally be, be laid, Uh, He's gathered to his fathers, is what you read in the Old Testament. They begin to do something differently. They begin to rebury those bones in a secondary manner, also in limestone. Remember, limestone is not susceptible to ritual impurity like pottery. Because it doesn't, the, the text doesn't say when your limestone becomes impure. So they felt like they were safe in that regard. So they're transferring the bones into limestone ossuaries. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna have you develop that a little bit more in our next segment, folks. And so we're talking with Dr. Scott Stripling about ritual purity in the context of the New Testament era. And we'll be right back after a brief break. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. I'm here today with Dr. Scott Stripling, and we're talking about the practice of ritual purity in the days of Jesus of Nazareth, our Lord. Now, Scott, we, uh, we were talking about what you called secondary burials in uh, these items called ossuaries. A simple term for them is a bone box, for lack of a, you know, keep it simple for our audience. But could you build on the talk about these ossuaries, their importance, when they were used, when they stopped using them, and so on. A first century tomb was shaped like my hand, and we've excavated these first century tombs. We had one at Kerbet El Makata, as a matter of fact. So they have the different loculi, or kokim, as they're called in Hebrew, that come off of them. So here's the burial area, where the, the benches where the body would be laid. After a year, the bones are then collected, placed into a bone box long enough for the femur bone, and about 20-25% of the time there are inscriptions on those bone boxes or those ossuaries that tell us who was buried in it, sometimes more than one family member. But the upshot is that in a tomb in the first century, you could have 50, 60, 70 family members all buried there because the ossuaries are pushed up into the coquim. And so over time, as I said, you can have dozens and dozens of family members buried in there. That's what a first century tomb looked like. Um, People ask sometime about the garden tomb. Is that the actual location? Well, it can't be. It's not, it, it, it does not have the locula. So um, this secondary burial practice is very, very unique to Second Temple period Judaism. So when do we see that uh, appear in the archaeological record? Maybe you could comment on that a little bit, the sort of significance of that. It begins about the same time that the mikveh immersion and the stone vessels do in the early first century B.C. And all of these indicators, by the way, Henry, uh, go up to A.D. 70, 
you have the traumatic event, uh, the watershed event of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70. They do continue on, but at a greatly reduced frequency on up through the second revolt period. Okay. So so what, uh, we're talking a little bit over 100 years, 125-year period, something yeah. something along those so lines. So they're very narrow. You know, when you get an ossuary and it's in context, well, you can very narrowly date that. So the the thought process of this is that that purity aspect again, because you, as you mentioned before, it's a limestone box, and uh, I guess there's a practical function to it too. Now you can fit a lot more of your family members in one tomb. Is that would that have been a consideration? I mean, what were your sure. thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. But remember, you could actually go to the tomb and touch the ossuary and not become unclean. Yes. So you can go visit your ancestors now without then having to go through the whole re- purification process afterward. Yeah, yeah. So so we see this movement taking place. And of course, this is in the providence of God setting the stage for the coming of Jesus, who's going to come and tell us how to really become pure before God. It's really extraordinary right. when you think theologically about a robust doctrine of God, uh, you know, that he's in control of all that. And even though people get the, the ideas sort of wrong or how to become pure wrong, God is working in all of that. I, I find it extraordinary, this, sure. this subject. Now, uh, so let me, let me shift a little bit more. You uh, mentioned to me about talking about coins. Now, at first you would say, well, what do coins have to do with <laughs> ritual purity? But I know that you're going to make, make the connection for the audience. So go ahead with that, please. We excavated a coin just a couple months ago when we were doing our winter project uh, that was a Hasmonean coin of Alexander Janaeus. That's the single most common coin that we excavate. Last summer, we had 154 coins from Shiloh. But in our years at Kerbet on Makater, we had over 1,300 coins that we excavated. And by far, the majority of those are Hasmonean 1st century B.C., maybe 2nd century B.C. coins. But here's the, the strange thing. They remain in circulation in the 1st century A.D. When we're positive that we're in a 1st century A.D. context, why are they still using 1st century B.C., 2nd century B.C. coins when there's obviously all these new Roman coins around? And I believe that it's a form of passive resistance. Using this Hasmonean coinage, which harkens back to a time of autonomy and Jewish independence, uh, and preferring those coins is a way of passively resisting uh, Rome. And uh, we're now finding this same thing is occurring at other sites throughout Israel. So I think there's something, uh, something very, very interesting there. Yeah, you know that, that's a it seems to me to be a reasonable inference from the evidence. You know that 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 coin, that, the Janius coin, Alexander Janius, would last for so long its usage. Um, it's 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 fascinating the ways that you know the Jews had to deal with the the rule of the Roman Empire. Um, Scott, I just, I just another thought I had was going back to stone vessels a little bit. I hope this isn't a curveball because we didn't plan to discuss this, but the cup that we found. Mm. Uh, talk about maybe that 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 stone vessel, the cup that we found at Kerbet El Makater. Um, we have a number of those cups. They used to be called measuring cups, but or they're, it's kind of a type of mug. You could have a handle on one side or on both sides, and. When we try to understand, like, what would have been used at Passover, for example, what was the cup of Christ? Um, I'm sure they were using stone vessels at Passover, so I have no doubt about that. And then if we, by extension, think, well, what would the cup have looked like? The most common cup, and the one with two handles, (laughs) the one that would have easily been passed around, would have been that, that stone vessel mug. And if that's the case with Think about the crusades that were <laughs> were undergone and the myths that were told and the legends that were spun about the Holy Grail. Uh, and, and I think they should have consulted an archaeologist. <laughs> yeah. Or think about the great Indiana Jones scene from the fourth movie where, you know, they're trying to choose the right cup. Yeah, they should have actually consulted an archaeologist. I think we could have told them what it looked like. And that's what's so fascinating about our field, Henry, is that we get to learn something new virtually every day. 
Yeah, you could have chose. You could have told them, Scott, on set that they have chosen poorly, as the movie says. <laughs> you know, right. nobody asked. Yeah, nobody, nobody asked. Well, Scott, uh, we're we're winding up here of our episode of Digging for Truth. You know, it's always a privilege to talk with you because I I know I learned so much, but your expertise and knowledge of archaeology and our know audience does too, and uh, we benefit from it greatly. So thank you for being with us again, and uh, thanks for sharing your insights on this important subject. Thrilled to be with you, Henry, and remind everybody to go to digshiloh.org if they want info about how to join us on this summer's excavation. Amen to that. Come and join us at Shiloh, friends. You can dig in the land of the Bible. We just want to encourage you folks to think about this subject of purity. How do you really become pure before a just and holy God? And that is through his son, Jesus, who gives us living water for eternal life. Thank you for joining us today.